Hello and welcome to this special rugby show right here on France 24. South Africa have beaten New Zealand 12 points to 11 to become world champions for a record fourth time. Over the next 25 or so minutes, I'll be joined here in studio by sports journalist Mboulila Tinta, as well as our very own Jean-Emile Jamin, who's live at the Stade de France. We'll be discussing just how the Springboks secured that record fourth title. Well, let's cross straight to the Stade de France, where Jean-Emile is standing by. Jean-Emile, first of all, how's the heart rate? Secondly, are the Springboks worthy winners? Talk us through the night. Uh, I, I have nothing else to say other than the Springboks won. <laughs> There's, there was literally no breath left in anyone's lungs in the stadium at the Stade de France because that was one of the most pulsating finals of all time. It probably matched the 2011 final, which New Zealand won against France 8-7. It probably matched the 1995 World Cup final. In fact, it was almost a exactly the same <laughs> in terms of the result. Uh, South Africa just getting over the line once again. They relied solely on the boots of Andre Pollard because he got all of South Africa's points, all 12 points coming off penalties in the first half. New Zealand tried through uh, their own fly half, Richie Mwanga. He halved the deficit to 6-3 at one point. Pollard got another at 9-3 and New Zealand got up to 12-6 at half time. But the most important part of that half was when Sam Kane, the captain for New Zealand, got sent to the Sinbin. The bunker system alleged that his shoulder went in uh, to the South African players' jaw, straight into uh, the jawline, and uh, so that was deemed a red card. But in the second half, despite having 14 men for the rest of the, uh, for the, rest of the game, New Zealand was the only team to score points in that second half. And it was through a try of Bowden Barrett and uh, the, uh, uh, the penalty, sorry, excuse me, because of uh, this uh, weather which uh, the players had to uh, navigate. And uh, basically then a penalty which uh, made it 11-12. Uh, uh, and um, that penalty coming before Bowden Barrett's uh, uh, try and uh, they couldn't match the conversion. So ultimately missing their kicks, missing their points on the field, and South Africa took the match. Uh, the most astonishing final that I have seen in my life, but I can't speak for others. Unbelievable. Well, we'll be staying with Jean-Emile throughout the programme, if he doesn't blow away, that is, because it doesn't look like the most pleasant night there at the Stade de France. We're nice and warm in the studio here, of course. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined in studio now by sports journalist Mbulelo Tinta Mbulelo. Great to have you in the studio. Great to be here. First things first, what's the party going to be like back in Johannesburg tonight? Oh, it's going to be rocking from Johannesburg to Cape Town tonight. Um, the Springboks are, are something which I, I cannot translate to the world. You may have seen some of the documentaries. What they mean to the nation is uh, they shape the economy quite literally and, and the emotional uh, temperature of, of the country. It's an, it's an incredible moment for us. It's incredible to join New Zealand uh, as sort of two in a row. and It's just us and, and we go to four on our own. It's, it's an incredible achievement for, for a country so desperate for to be united and this kind of, this team just it, it keeps doing this for us um let's talk about the game itself tonight that south african game plan was pitch perfect until maybe about 50 minutes kind of fell apart from there but they just held on H how did they get it done in your opinion tonight yeah so i think what you saw tonight was an emotionally mature performance i think everybody's gone it's lucky but it's three times now what happens when these great teams, because this is what we're talking about now, we're talking about pedigree over two World Cups here. When these great teams have to go to the deep end, they stay calm. And you saw the Springboks tonight never emotionally fell apart, even though they weren't playing their best rugby. And the game plan didn't go according uh, to plan. And, and obviously Bongi's injury, but emotional maturity, believing in the man next to you. And you've seen eight years of hard work pay off tonight, I, I believe, in terms of systems and, and believing in the man next to you uh, consistently. John O'Meal mentioned it, that red card for New Zealand captain Sam Kane in the first half. Yellow, of course, initially then got upgraded by that bunker system. What's your opinion on it? Was it deserved, do you think? I have to disagree. I, I do not believe it was malicious. Um, you know, sometimes in rugby and, and particularly in these physical sport, you've got to also judge the character, right? Uh, there's the letter of the law and then there's the spirit of the law. I do not believe it was a red card. Now, as a South African, obviously in my heart, I'm thinking red card, yes. But in rugby, we have to be willing to say 
it is a physical sport and the margins are so tight. I don't like that a World Cup final is decided by something so marginal. I, I, I do not believe it was a red card and, and, and I cannot be convinced differently. I think Sam Kane is extremely unlucky to be sent off there. Yeah, jean Emile, let me go back to you. What could the All Blacks have done differently, especially when they're down to 14 men? They did give it a right good go. The last half an hour, it looked like they were just inches away from scoring quite a few times. What could they have done? What was that 1% that they were lacking uh, to win that fourth World Cup title tonight? Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to say because they did nearly everything correct. I think it's, you know, Jacques Ninaba, the South African coach the other day, when they won a game, they said, the margins were marginal and uh, it's a very basic statement but I think that applies exactly the same to this game especially for New Zealand they scored a try before Bowden Barrett managed to cross the line and it was a sensational try they still had 14 men on the pitch and they had that intricate running rugby play uh, you know the quick hands which they so associated associated with the All Blacks and it was brought back the TMO a judge that in the lineout several phases before that try was scored that the uh, All Blacks knocked it on literally with finger to finger and it was something that only a TMO could have spotted and it's just those tiny errors in the crucial moments which they couldn't get right also with missed kicks uh, from uh, Jordy Barrett it was uh, late on in the uh, in the second half that could have swung the game completely in New Zealand's favour so uh, Richie Moanga also missed one. They left points out on the field and in matches this tight, that is going to cost you and you have to take advantage of that, especially when you are down to 14 men. And especially when South Africa couldn't capitalize uh, because uh, obviously, you know, the, the South Africans just never found a way through in terms of the try. They also made some mistakes. Uh, you have to bear that in mind. So uh, under these slippery conditions, I just think that it was the barest of margins that 14 men of New Zealand just couldn't get right on the day. John Mill, let's put this into context, this victory, because South Africa, on the route to winning this, they've beaten Scotland in the pool stage. They, of course, lost to Ireland, world number one, but still had to play them in the pool stages. Quarterfinals, hosts and one of the favourites, France. Then in the semis, they battle past England, beat them by one point. And then tonight, they, meet the, they, they beat the All Blacks again by one point. Is this, in context, it must go down as one of the greatest World Cup victories of all time? I think that there has never been a tougher run to get to the final and to win it. Uh, that, again, that I can remember. Uh, to face off against Ireland, who was ranked first in the world at the time, it was an unbelievable game, which South Africa lost. And now, by the way, have uh, become the second team since they did it back in 2019 to lose a pool stage game and go on to win the tournament. Then of course Scotland, this is possibly the best Scottish team of all time under Gregor Townsend. France under Fabien Galtier is sensational despite missing Roman Intermap for the entire tournament. That game to win it by one point, I don't know if there was any other team that could have done it to France other than South Africa. They just didn't care that they were completely uh, away, uh, in front of all the away fans and uh, at a home nation tournament. Against the English, they didn't play well. The DNA, it's somehow they found a way and now to beat New Zealand. So Scotland, Ireland, France, New Zealand, ultimately in the final with England just before. It's just, you know, at the end of the day, you have to look at the teams they beat and say, congratulations, you beat the best to be the best. Mbulelo, going back to you, how much did experience play a part tonight? Because if you look at the starting 15 of South Africa tonight, 12 of that starting 15 actually played four years ago in the final, which they, of course, won. How much does that make a difference, that experience of knowing how to win, being there, having done it already? Absolutely. I, I think what you saw tonight is a template for the Northern Hemisphere sides to take on. Razi Erasmus and the guys and uh, Jacques Ninaba have built, you've got to think, an eight-year period. It is no irony that tonight is the most experienced Springbok team ever to play in a test match. That is meticulous planning from um, Rassi and, and Nina. But what that builds is what a word I love, pedigree. So they know exactly what it, go, it takes to go to the trenches and they know the man next to them is as invested as they are. Now, these are the little things that matter is we don't have to think we are operating in unison. And you saw three games where they played terribly 
and one purely on pedigree. Experience is everything. France need to learn from this. Ireland need to learn from this. England need to learn from this. You cannot think in four-year stints. You must think in eight years to build that experience, and then the talent will, will come to the top, as you saw with the Springboks tonight. We talk about forward planning. Let's move on from today and look a bit towards the future. These sides are, of course, littered with legends of the game and some we may have seen tonight for the last time in a World Cup. Let's start with the world champions uh, in Bulelo. What's going to happen with this Springbok side? Because they are massively experienced. Some would call them old. Average, say, <laughs> uh, average age of over 30. There's going to be a lot of turnover uh, before Australia 2027. How will they manage that? Do they have the depth and resources the young players coming through how do they manage that going forward so th this again comes to the brilliance of Ninaba and Rassi Erasmus now in the background uh, those who aren't hardcore Springbok fans may think oh this is the end of an era but he has bred the Jasper Visas to, to come through uh, you know he has bred the youngsters there, there is another generation Esther Hazen will come in at Inside Centre there's another generation that's been around greatness for four years now so although on the outside it may look like the end of an era but the way Ninaba, the way South African rugby and, and the great Rassi Rasmus have planned it is there is clearly a, sese a, a secession plan. And you, you're going to see us roll out some youngsters uh, over the next four years that are already 20, 25 caps into it. So, so they've planned it meticulously. And this is where it's important to, to, to have that long term planning. I, I, I'm not worried at all as a Springbok fan. If anything, I'm excited because the springboard is so high for that next generation. Well, talk to me about Nina Bay. You mentioned him there, of course, in collaboration with Razi Erasmus. This is his last game as Springboks yep. coach. He'll he'll leave after that to join the Leinster setup. Hell of a last game. What what a legacy he's going to leave. How is he going to be viewed back in South Africa? You, you've got to you've got to say he's now an icon. Um, you know, always a man in the background. Razi Erasmus kind of takes the limelight. Uh, Nina Bay is an incredible, incredible figure. You, you know, in South Africa, we just love people who just get the job done. No frills, no fuss just get the job done, especially the country where we are, is that to us it means so much to have leading figures who just get the job done. And remember, the Springboks re represent something bigger. On the political and, and sort of they bind the nation across racial, religious lines, he's now a figure of uniting us, a martyr of sorts, and he will leave um, with our blessing and we wish him nothing but the best. He is, a, he is an icon and the statues will be going up from Johannesburg to Cape Town. John Emile, let's let me ask you a similar question because it's actually Ian Foster, the All Blacks coach, last game in charge as well. He'll be replaced by Scott Robertson after the tournament. He's come under a lot of criticism, especially from um, the New Zealand press. How do you think his time in charge is gonna is gonna be is gonna be viewed? Because yes, they lost a, a lot more games than expected early on, but he's brought them within an inch of winning another World Cup. Yeah, but inches matter and I think everything was riding on his reputation on this World Cup win. In fact, it was not so long ago, just at the back end of last year, where the New Zealand Herald said the time is up for uh, Ian Foster. And, uh, you know, it's a very unforgiving business. He was the assistant coach for Sir Graham Henry. He was worked under uh, the coaches that came after as well. And uh, he, he was always in the setup and finally got his chance, uh, but it just didn't deliver really where it mattered in terms of consistency as well. If you can remember, between 2011 and 2015, Steve Hansen came in as well uh, for the uh, second win for the All Blacks. That was two uh, World Cups in a row. New Zealand only lost four games in that entire period. That was when they were captained by Richie McCaw. Dan Carter was pulling the strings as well. So Ian Foster came in later on and he, he was very pragmatic, but then at the same time, he lost to Argentina at home in Christchurch. He lost to uh, South Africa several times. Uh, he lost that series at home to Ireland. Very crucial matches, and it just built up and built up. And the New Zealand fans couldn't really see the progress that they re anticipated. And also, Ian Foster got the job ahead of Scott Robertson. You have to remember that. Scott Razor Robertson, who was at the Crusaders, and a lot of people were then calling for Robertson to take over. Now he will uh, be awarded with a four-year contract. Technically speaking, this is Ian Foster's contract running out. He hasn't been dismissed, but everything was riding on a World Cup win. And because he hasn't delivered it, now the only thing that New Zealand fans are going to remember are the defeats Obviously, they did win the rugby championship in every season that uh, Foster was in charge. But sincerely, this is the bread and butter. This is the World Cup. 
and uh, it just won't matter for those All Black fans. They will want this trophy and they will just be looking now forward to Scott Robertson taking the helm. And Bulelo, a quick word on, on Foster? Look, I, I've said uh, personally is this is no longer the All Blacks. I call them the New Zealand international rugby team because when, when, when we call you All Blacks, they've lost the swagger. Uh, F Fozzie, Ian Foster is a great man, but I'm not sure he's a number one. Not everybody's a number one. Some people are best as number two. His role is a number two. This is too much for him. And Scott Robertson will bring back that swagger. He's done it at the Crusaders. The, when you're the All Blacks, you need to be the gold standard. And they haven't been now uh, for, four, for four years. It was time for Fozzie to go. I think he should have gone two years ago, to be completely honest with you. It never, ever worked. And when the, when the New Zealand society is not with you, with the All Blacks, it, it's never going to work. And, and it never was. He, he's not made for this role. Talk to me about Sia Khaleesi. Yeah. He's become the second captain to lift a trophy twice in consecutive tournaments, of course. It might be his last game as a captain in a World Cup. He'll be 36 by the time, the time Australia rolls round. Talk to me a bit about his legacy, not just as a rugby player, but as a human being, because this guy really is an icon, not just in South Africa, but in world sport in general. You know, the difference between uh, fiction and non-fiction is that, you know, fiction has to make sense. You know, non-fiction, the, the reality of life doesn't have to make sense. His rise to w where it is, when you tell it out loud, it's almost impossible. You know, we say working class, whatever's below that in terms of poverty, to become one of the leading icons in world sport is truly something memorable. You, you know, the great Nelson Mandela, of course, um, was before. I don't want to compare what C is doing to that, but he's got a, a, a lot of that. Is He's selfless. He takes a lot of criticism. He, he's been through so much. But what he is, is I don't care about myself. I want to unite. And that's very, very rare, particularly for alpha males who are well paid. And at the front is he never makes it about himself. This man is a true great of not just rugby, but of, of South African and, and global society. Well, it's been a tournament full of twists and turns, star players, flops and incredible moments. Let's have a little look back over the last 50 days now. Emulelo, I ask you for your player of the tournament before we went on air. You gave me the name of Andre Pollard, who was initially excluded from that Springbok squad. Why? I'll tell you what. Love Mani Libok, but you saw when the grown-up came in the room, they took him off after 33 minutes. Andre Pollard is a legendary calming figure in, in the sort of ilk of Johnny Wilkinson, in the ilk of DC, is that when he comes in, what he does is he brings the temperature down for the spring box because when you can make mistakes around somebody who organizes everything so brilliantly, it doesn't matter. He, he makes everybody more relaxed and you saw then the spring box could play freely and even in mistake rugby, is he puts the pack on the front foot. He's a grown-up. He's the greatest fly half South Africa has ever produced and, and you saw it tonight. Again, an adult, we're playing badly, not a problem. I'll ping it in the corner, we'll go and play there. And then New Zealand, if you can beat us, that, that's up to you. But, but he's, the, he's the best fly half we've, we've ever had and now a certified legend. And just to point out, Mbulelo gave me that pick before Pollard scored all the points to win the Springboks, the title <laughs> tonight. So, so a justified pick, maybe. jean Emil, you picked Bundiaki. Despite Ireland's early exit, why did you pick him? Just witnessing him live, uh, I have never seen a player single-handedly dominate in a match which his own team was already dominating so well. So it's, it's okay when you are a great player surrounded by mediocrity, you can almost shine. But when the entire team around you is unbelievably special and you can still show that you are even a step above that, I was just overawed by Bundiaki's presence, the meters that he could gain from his center position, uh, brilliant uh, around the breakdown areas, just uh, finding his way over the gain line. He was sensational, uh, certainly in the match against South Africa, which Ireland won. And in the match against New Zealand, they managed to keep him a little bit more quiet, but nonetheless, he was still such a menacing presence. I think he was the complete package. Of course, you can look to other World Player of the Year nominees like Eben Irzabeth. He had an unbelievable tournament. Ardi Sevea at number eight for New Zealand. He was something special, really, especially in that uh, match against Ireland. He was man of the match there. But uh, yes, for me, Bundiaki was just a surprise and such an exciting player to watch. Uh, and unfortunately for Ireland and the way the draw was, they met New Zealand too early for many fans. And John Emile, let's move on to flop now. To no one's surprise, you picked Australia, a first ever pool stage exit for them. Talk to me about their torrid tournament. Oh, well, I think it just, everything that could have gone wrong went 
horrifically from the minute they appointed Eddie Jones as coach. And that's down to the Australian Rugby Federation. Uh, it's not so much the players because, well, what could they do? They just weren't up to standard, uh, but that's not their fault because they tried. They just weren't very good. And unfortunately, when you look at this team selection that Australia went into the World Cup with, they left Michael Hooper back in Australia. They left Quade Cooper, two of the most experienced players that you could possibly want. Um, and that's, excuse me, and that's all uh, down to Eddie Jones. Uh, there were other stories that uh, he's been talking to the Japanese Union to retake over from there. And this is coming up ahead of the World Cup in Australia. Huge, huge questions have to be asked uh, about the entire setup and the format that rugby has taken on there. Uh, because really, it's not looking healthy for uh, the Australian Union. And they're such a proud country, of course. They wanted it back in 1999. And uh, they wanted it before that also in 91. Really, it's just. It's sad to see. Embulelo, your flop of the tournament. You went for Ireland. I mean, I wore this nice green tie <laughs> to be, so I could be the only Irish representation on the final day. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to disagree. Another quarterfinal exit for the supposed best team in the world. Yeah, pe people are saying Sean Klein is uh, the first Irishman to get to a World Cup final and, and he's won one. So uh, there, there's a dig at you. Listen, we know how life works. Is all disappointment is directly uh, correlated to expectation. And the Irish have positioned themselves as generational, as the next level. Is Here's why I say they're a flop. They played the best they've ever played. And this is the worst New Zealand team I've seen in 31 years. And it still wasn't good enough. Now, for me, you, if you're going to talk it, talk it. But then you've got to deliver. And then they came up against... A mediocre uh, New Zealand international rugby team and just weren't there. I'm afraid you can't talk like that and not deliver. It, it's just the way this level of sport is. Finally, we've got moment of the tournament. Jean-Emile, give us a quick word on yours. I think you went for the Cheslin Colby uh, charge down in the quarterfinal. That, that moment that made all the difference in uh, the Springboks defence of the World Cup. Yes, uh, I think it was just something that the world of rugby had not really seen before and it took everyone by surprise least of all Thomas Ramos uh, and now I mean a lot of people were looking back at that charge down and saying because of that those are the two points that France needed to win that game and it was just that extra bit of guts to almost play at the limit with the referee with uh, Ben O'Keefe on the day. Uh, of course, it left many, many French supporters furious because they felt that Cheslin Colby had left his line. But he came out later and said, firstly, he understands Thomas Ramos's kicking style. He's played with him for many years. And once again, it just shows you those margins when you're dealing with them. And rugby really is a game of margins. If you get them right, that is the difference between a player who is good and a player who is world-class and possibly legendary. And it's a moment which will live forever in the memory, Cheslin Colby's charge down of Thomas Ramos's kick. Emilela, you picked a moment that I think I, I probably personally would have picked for my moment of the tournament. Portugal getting their first ever World Cup win and showing that there is rugby outside the, the sort of the elite teams. And, and I mean, they had a brilliant tournament in general, didn't they? So I just want to thank the Portuguese uh, for a, a tremendous um, sort of my teen years because they gave me a man called Jose Mourinho. I'm a diehard Chelsea fan. But now they've given their own people something to be proud of. Uh, I mean, from Madeira to Porto, you should be proud of these guys because this is not your thing right now. This is tremendous for rugby, those tier two nations. This is what we want to see. And listen, Fiji had their proper guys. So I don't want to hear excuses from Fiji. I love the Fijians. They're a warrior nation. But I'm sorry. Portugal deserved every moment of it. And oh my goodness, a Cinderella, st uh, Cinderella story. Don't you love to see it? You do love to see it. I'm going to give you one final word. 2027, Australia, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are the Springboks going to become the first team in rugby history to do a three-peat? Take it to the bank. And you need a private bank with a massive vault. Because right now, I will declare... The Springboks, number one. We are now the greatest rugby nation in the world. I say we. I should be staying professional, but I'm not going to. We are now, the only thing that count, counts is the William Webb Ellis. We are the greatest nation in the world. Count it now. Number three on the way in Australia. Embolello, thank you very much for, for that. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us in thank studio. So I've enjoyed it so much. Gone by way too quickly. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks to Embolello again, of course. And thank you to Jean-Emile. 
live from the Stade de France. Well, there we have it. After 48 matches, what a tournament. We've seen Portugal make history for all the right reasons and Australia for all the wrong ones. We've seen eight red cards and a mammoth 325 tries. And at the end of it all, the Springboks are world champions again. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned for more world news in just a few minutes' time.